I didn't think of Western civilization as a project that it's a bit like a building that sits upon well-defined foundations. I think of it as more of a project that is an ongoing one in which we as a culture are engaged and which rests ultimately on the willingness to be engaged in that process, which is a process really of self-questioning and of self-understanding. And so its ultimate foundation is the openness that is required for that self-questioning to work, openness to others, openness to the works we've inherited, openness to the thought of really the great thinkers, both in the present and in the past. Western civilization as such has come up with many ideas that we now take for granted, ways of looking at the world, ways of thinking about the world, often conflicting ways of looking at the world and thinking about the world. Uh, everything from the notion of freedom and uh, conversely the notion of slavery, what we mean by it and what its opposite is, through to really great works, uh, great works, be they works of art, be they works of literature, be they works of music and so on and so forth. So all of those are fantastic achievements that enrich our lives every day and that we draw on when we think about the world as it is. Uh, but to my mind, probably uh, the greatest achievement of Western civilization is the notion that we need to come to terms with our own thinking that we have to not merely be uh, uh, creatures who are conscious and reflecting on the world, but we are creatures who reflect on our own reflection, who think about why is it that we think this way? And what are the consequences of thinking this way? And how can we change the way we think? And that notion, I think, is really quite distinctive and is a fantastic achievement which has spread worldwide and has made the world we live in a much better place. Well, um, I, I suspect many, and in part that's simply because um, so much of it is available and there's so much of it that it's become virtually impossible for any single person to be the way the great thinkers were, say, in the 18th or even 19th century where they could pretend to some degree of comprehensiveness. Each of us really absorbs only a very small sample of what there is out there and that limits our field of vision and our ability to appreciate the richness of, of the menu. But on top of that, obviously there are some aspects of thought that are given less value than, than perhaps I would ideally like. And clearly this is uh, a matter of, of, of judgment. Um, and it's not so much, I, I don't believe, a question of the weight that people put on particular ways of thinking about the world relative to others, say the scientific way of thinking about the world versus an understanding of the humanities, though that is no doubt an aspect of it. But it's really that um, if there's a, a, a fundamental thing that, or skill, and I, I hesitate to call it a skill, but it's almost a, a capability 
that I, I believe you can learn by engaging with our cultural inheritance. It's the skill of, of judgment. And the skill of judgment is a very special but very important skill. And it's not easily defined and it's not even easily characterized. But what it boils down to is, is this. There are some things that we know more or less are true as a matter of scientific fact. And there are other things that we know are true almost as a matter of logical derivation. But there are many things on which we hold opinions. And those opinions hopefully are well-informed opinions. They're, they're opinions that, that we derive through the exercise of reason and of questioning. But they are opinions. They're not uh, amenable to proof or disproof in the way that, say, a logical statement is, or a mathematical statement is, or a factual statement might be. And the capacity to form the right opinions and to test your own opinions and test the opinions of others, that's really what we mean by judgment. And judgment has really been perhaps one of the central elements in the work and effort of the great Western thinkers over the centuries. Because they have engaged with the same problems that we have, they have engaged with the same dilemmas, dilemmas which don't have right answers in any simple sense. And in trying to think through, well, how would we know what a good or better answer is relative to a worse answer. They've thought a lot about this capacity of judgment. Hannah Arendt, in um, one of her great essays, says that judgment is the capacity that saves us when the chips are down. When we face a situation for which we don't have a script and which we've never engaged in before. And in that sense, I think the engagement with what there is of best in the culture and civilization we've inherited in the great works, uh, it's most important uh, 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 gift to us is that of helping us to improve our judgment. And if we can do that, then I think we will truly appreciate the value of that heritage. Probably the most important advice would be to to study them and and to engage with them. Uh, I think many young people believe there's a lot wrong with the world, uh, and obviously the Western world is a very large part of the world, and the Western cultural inheritance is a very significant factor shaping the world we live in, and I can understand that, because if you look at the world we live in, it has so many problems, and so many things that really cry out for change, that when you are young, and you have a long life ahead of you, well, you hope for a better world to live in in future, that a better world, which is a world which has in one way or another if not solved its problems, at least ameliorated them. And so the question then becomes, how can you do that? Uh, and to my mind, you really can't do that if you don't understand the world you live in. Uh, and understanding the world you live in is a, a very complex task. Uh, and it's a complex task because our world is so complicated and because uh, we didn't choose it. We, in a way, have it cast upon us. I mean, Heidegger, the German philosopher, 
talks about us as being thrown into the world. We don't get a choice about whether to be born or not. We're, we're thrown into it and, and we find it as it is and somehow we have to cope with the, the, the world as it is. And so to deal with that, we have to try to analyze it, make sense of it, understand why is it as, as it is. Now, in that respect, uh, what we are calling Western civilization is, in my view, is important for at least two reasons. The first reason is that while ideas don't make the world, human beings act in part as a result of the ideas they hold. And the ideas they hold that have been influential uh, and that come really from that cultural inheritance uh, have obviously been crucial in shaping the world. So if you want to better understand that world, you have to grapple with those ideas and what their substance is and then how they've affected human action. But there's a second reason as well, uh, and that is that uh, really the beauty of the great thinkers of all kinds is that they too have been struggling with these questions. Uh, uh, the, 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 the treasure we have is that uh, we don't just need to ask uh, our friends, our neighbors, our contemporaries, well, what do you think about this or that? We can ask Aristotle, we can ask Plato, we can ask Shakespeare, we can ask Adam Smith, we can ask Karl Marx. And that, in turn, has two great benefits. The first benefit is that it gives you a much richer storehouse on which to draw. And the second benefit is that you feel much less lonely in your quest to understand the world you're living in. Uh, whatever it may be that you are experiencing, whatever the difficulties that confront you and your community, it's very likely that others have thought about them at some time. And uh, uh, if you uh, uh, try to just deal with them on, on your own, they're not only more difficult, but they can be absolutely daunting. Uh, and I think one of the great joys in life uh, is the joy of discovering that someone else has grappled with that problem. And here's what they've come up with. Pro possibly you don't agree with it. Uh, quite likely you don't agree with it. But at least it will give you a bit more of a structure and uh, a base to build on as you try to deal with your own problems. And that's why Really, when you look at the, at the great revolutionaries, the people who, uh, rightly or wrongly, truly wanted to change the world, uh, they, far from uh, simply rejecting uh, the culture they had inherited, they engaged with it extraordinarily deeply. It's very difficult to find and I don't think nowadays you would easily find uh, someone who was, in many respects, as well read as Karl Marx was. Great lover of Shakespeare, uh, recited Shakespeare all the time, knew most of Shakespeare by heart. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then again, just sticking with the Marxist or Marxian tradition, depending on how you want to call it. Um, uh, uh, who is engaged more seriously with Western literature than George Lukács, who with Western music than Theodore Adorno, uh, um, and you, uh, who with contemporary with with great 
the great philosophers than the early Jürgen Habermas. Uh, in, in a way, the, 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 the first duty of the revolutionary is to seriously understand the world he or she lives in. And so if you want to change that world, understand it, and to understand it, the only way you'll be able to do that is if you grapple deeply with the culture which we've inherited. Yeah, well, I mean, is it, is it important? I mean, that's, that's a good question. I mean, you know, clearly in life you meet many people who either haven't studied them at all or have only studied them terribly superficially and are perfectly happy people. They're often very successful people. So it's neither the road to happiness nor the road to success. And so if that were all you were worried about, then it wouldn't matter at all. Uh, um, and clearly not everyone needs to, uh, uh, to, to, to study them. Um, so you can do many things in life without um, the vaguest uh, knowledge of them. Uh, and so in that sense, from a kind of instrumental perspective, uh, I'm not sure it necessarily is uh, important for everyone. Uh, on the other hand, I think if you don't study them, you lead a poorer life. And you lead a poorer life for yourself and you contribute less to, to, to the world, which isn't to say it's the only way of contributing to the world, but it's one way of contributing to the world. And you diminish uh, your own uh, understanding and appreciation of the world we live in. And so it's, in many respects, it's a way of making your life richer. Now, that's not to say it's an easy way of making your life richer, because there is no easy way of making your life richer. And the people who claim there is are quacks. They're, you know, basically are, are, are promising you something that by the nature of reality you can't, it can't, cannot be delivered. Um, uh, but if you're willing to bear its pains and the inherent difficulties that it involves, if you're willing to do that, uh, you'll find it uh, uh, in the end uh, rewarding. That said, uh, it is important to attach uh, a word of warning to that advice, which, and really the warning is, is this. I always think of the engagement with as it were the great writers, the great artists, the great thinkers, whatever you want to call them, be they in the present or in the past, as uh, um, not only enlightening as such, but also it's a fantastic way of learning humility. <laughs> uh, and it teaches you humility in, in many, many respects, not solely because it, 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 it shows you what really great thinking looks like compared to, uh, at least in my case, my own meager efforts, uh, uh, but also because it's one of those endeavors where the further you go, uh, the more you realize the extent to which you've merely scratched the surface, um, the extent to which all you've done is begin to explore the issues. And so in that sense, the more you learn, the more you feel ignorant. Uh, ignorant because no one in their lifetime could possibly uh, 
come to grips with the totality of it. Uh, and, uh, 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 and, and so uh, it, it is an exercise in learning your own limits. And learning your own limits, I think, is, is, is a very valuable thing to know. And it's a valuable thing to know because it, uh, it uh, uh, also allows you to understand what you can do and what you cannot do and so helps you be prudent and hopefully exercise good judgment. Well, I can sympathize with political leaders. Um, they're under enormous pressure to uh, communicate very simply and in terms that arouse emotion uh, because really politics in many respects does require the arousal of emotions of strong sentiments so that you get approval uh, uh, or, or cast disapproval on the proposals of others. So it's in the nature of politics and especially of the kind of politics that we live in today, that you will have uh, a tendency to to reduce things to their simplest nature. Yet, at the same time, uh, if you want people to really understand the choices you're trying to make, you have to go back to what are the values that underpin those choices? What is it that guides you in thinking that the right approach or the best approach to a particular problem is to address it this way rather than that way? We tend nowadays to assume that many problems are really technical problems, that there is in a way, a solution that a technical expert can come up with. And that so long as we rely on the, the technical expertise, then that's all there is to it. Yet, in reality, what we're always doing, including the technical experts, is we're making choices over values. Uh, how much we value this aspect of life relative to that aspect of life, uh, how willing we are to sacrifice one particular value for the sake of the other. A community that is aware of those choices is in a much better position to assess whatever is being proposed in terms of the alternatives on offer. And if you uh, ignore that aspect of political choice, which really goes to fundamental questions of values and differences that exist, and that must exist in every human community, about the weight we put on competing values. If you ignore those, you both reduce the quality of the public debate and expose yourself ultimately to, in my view, a backlash as people in their own way, realize that that's what you're smuggling in and that your values do not necessarily align with their own. It's a bit like asking a fish about water. If you've grown up in water, uh, you're not necessarily aware that you rather like it. Um, and, and so you just it becomes second nature in a way, and second nature is always opaque to us. Um, but in, in my own case, um, I think it really went back to the fact that uh, I wanted to understand the world we live in. And I realized pretty quickly that I had two options. 
option A, I could try to reinvent everything that had been thought before me, which I doubt I was capable of doing. Indeed, I'm sure I was not capable of doing. Or option B, which was, in Isaac Newton's famous phrase, to stand on the shoulders of giants. And to stand on the shoulders of giants, you first have to climb up. You have to climb up those giants. And those giants are the great works that you mention and, and many, many others. And once you do that, uh, you, it sparks your interest, it deepens your ability to understand them, and you want to do it to a greater extent. You want to uh, fill the lacunae and cope with all the things that still deeply puzzle you, and I must say there's tons of those, at least for me. Uh, and so when a new question arises to me that I'm trying to deal with in my columns, I, I always think to myself, well, what would, you know, what, what did Aristotle say about this? Um, maybe I, maybe he said nothing, or maybe what he said I won't be able to find, or maybe I'll find it and I'll disagree with it or think it's not particularly useful. Uh, but uh, um, uh, uh, even if I do that, I feel I'm, I'm slightly better off. Uh, I've learned something uh, in the process. And one other aspect of it, which is, I think, important at least as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure is important for other people who are engaged in the process of writing, is that you often find that those great thinkers are also great writers. And that not only have they thought through the problem, but they've given it a beautifully succinct, perfectly clear expression. Shakespeare tends to be like that. Hannah Arendt can, can be like that. Um, and, uh, and many others. And so you say, gosh, what a beautiful way of putting that. And I think it was T.S. Eliot, in fact, I'm sure it was T.S. Eliot, who, who said, um, good writers borrow, great writers steal. I don't just believe for a moment that I'm a great writer, but I certainly do a lot of stealing in the sense that I'll say, gosh, that's a nice way of putting it. So I'll pick that out and then I'll say, um, as Hannah Arendt put it, because if Hannah Arendt has put it that way, um, uh, uh, why not share that with all the people reading your, your column? And so that's why I do try, whenever I can, to, uh, uh, to bring in that storehouse that, of, of treasures that is what we broadly call uh, uh, Western civilization, and that, in my view, uh, is well worth uh, drawing upon and airing. In a way, it's, we, we live in a, a very paradoxical world because on the one hand, we live in a world where there is more speech than there has ever been. We can't cope with just the sheer quantity of material that is thrown at us every day by the internet, even very good material. Uh, I don't think there's been a time in history when we've been as information rich as we are today. And certainly in terms of what is available on the menu, um, uh, 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 there's no poverty out there, it's, it's on the contrary. It's, it's cornucopia to the point of excess. It's, a, it's an excess of, of material out there. So there's that aspect to it. On the other hand, it's also true that there are many symptoms of, of, of intolerance where we slang off each other, we 
he we don't like uh, the, 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 the fact of being exposed to opinions different from our own. People worry a great deal about uh, uh, about uh, the possibility that saying, uh, 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 stating views that others disagree with will somehow offend them or injure them or damage them. Uh, and, uh, and obviously uh, that can be true. Well, we can find views offensive and hurtful, um, just as we can find people offensive and, and hurtful. Uh, one of the ways in which they can act hurtful is, is, is through speech. Uh, um, but I, I, I think correctly there's a very strong presumption that uh, we should allow speech to be free and that it's only in very narrow circumstances that uh, you should limit it. Uh, Benjamin Cardoza, who was a great American judge, said freedom of speech is the first freedom. And I think what he meant by that is that without freedom of speech, you can't have freedom of thought. And without freedom of thought, no other freedom is, is humanly possible. Uh, for freedom of speech to really exist, and freedom of thought, we have to be able to engage with each other. And to engage with each other, we have to learn how to argue without quarreling. That's really what civility is about. Civility is fundamentally, at least as far as deliberation and thought is concerned, civility is fundamentally about learning how to disagree. Uh, and that is something that, of course, doesn't come natural to any of us. Uh, because if you disagree with me, it's no doubt because you're wrong. And so it's not only my right not to accept your opinion, but almost my duty to correct your opinion. So the notion that we should be able to agree to disagree and understand why we disagree doesn't come natural to us. It has to be learnt, and it's learned socially, and it's ingrained in our society. Uh, if we lose that, if we lose the training in understanding how to disagree and how to cope with disagreement in a mature adult way, if we shelter people from disagreement rather than exposing them to them and allowing them to learn how to deal with them, then freedom of speech cannot exist. And if it does exist, it will exist in a stunted and ultimately emptied form.